Thank you very much. It's a great honour and pleasure to join you here at the University of Wolverhampton to celebrate LGBT History Month 2017. I was asked to specifically address the global battle for LGBT rights. As we all know, there have been huge positive gains in Britain over the last decade and a half in terms of rolling back the many historic anti-gay, anti-lesbian, anti-bisexual and anti-trans laws that have existed. We've made really big, significant progress. And of course, this year we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the first of those major reforms which took place way back in 1967 when there was a partial decriminalisation of male homosexuality, albeit only in England and Wales, and albeit in very limited, defined circumstances. But since then, in the following 50 years, we have made very significant changes. Britain today is a very different country. We are now one of the best countries in the world when it comes to the human rights of LGBT people. But the picture elsewhere is very different. There have been gains in other countries, but overall the picture globally is still quite bleak. If you think about it, in more than 70 countries, homosexuality is still totally illegal. In some cases, this applies only to male homosexuality, but increasingly it also criminalizes sex between women. And if you examine those countries, you can see that the penalties for same-sex relations range from a few years imprisonment right up to life imprisonment and even the death penalty in a handful of Muslim majority states. Transgender people are also criminalised, sometimes explicitly with laws against cross-dressing and sometimes just through the use of public order and public indecency laws to criminalise their lives. So globally, we still have a very long way to go. Indeed, there is, in 2017, not a single international human rights convention that recognises sexual rights and gender rights as human rights. So when it comes to sexual orientation and gender identity, those rights are not enshrined in any international human rights agreement. They're not in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They're not in the European Convention on Human Rights. And to me it is a glaring and shocking omission because the right to love and have a sexual relationship with a person of your choosing surely is a fundamental human right. As much as the right to marry, the right of free speech, the right to protest, freedom of expression and so on. You know, love, sex and relationships are some of the most important things in all our lives. Yet, the right to make that choice between a person of the same sex, or the opposite sex, or either or both sexes, or people who are intersex, those rights are not enshrined anywhere. And that is a, a glaring omission. Um, when we look at the United Nations, it too has a very checkered history. The Human Rights Council has in recent years, but only in recent years, begun to pass resolutions and declarations condemning anti-LGBT discrimination and deploring violence against LGBT people, urging equal rights legislation to protect LGBT people against discrimination in the workplace, housing and the provision of goods and services, and urging member states to enforce hate crime laws to protect LGBT citizens. But that's really only in the last few years. Previously, 
all attempts to acknowledge sexual orientation and gender identity rights were vetoed by a coalition of mostly African, Muslim, and the Vatican. Um, those um, countries and those institutions organized within the UN to stop any positive declaration in favor of LGBT communities. But we are making progress because there have been a number of uh, resolutions and declarations by the UN Human Rights Council. And of course, just in recent weeks, we've seen the appointment and then the reiteration of the appointment of the first UN expert on LGBT issues. You'll be familiar with the attempt to get him uh, basically sacked, but that did fail in the Human Rights Council, even though quite a number of member states, a very significant number of member states, did seek to block that appointment. Going right back though, there is actually some precedent in the United Nations way back in 1994, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, a Tasmanian man took a case to what was then called the Human Rights Committee, where he argued that the total criminalization of same-sex relations in the Australian state of Tasmania was a violation of his rights as a gay man. And way back then, in 1994, the committee ruled that it was a violation of his rights and it did compel the Australian state of Tasmania to eventually decriminalise homosexuality, which until that time had carried a maximum sentence of 21 years imprisonment. Um, so, there is progress, and there has been progress, but it's very, very checkered. Um, you are all familiar with the Commonwealth, the Association of Nations, most of the former British colonies, which has a Commonwealth Charter. In this charter, it enshrines the principles of equality, non-discrimination, human rights, and individual freedom. But in 37 out of the 52 member states of the Commonwealth, still today, there is a total prohibition on same-sex relations. Again, with penalties ranging from 10 or 14 years imprisonment in countries like Nigeria and Jamaica, right up to life imprisonment in countries like Uganda and Tanzania. So the Commonwealth is not living up to its own professed commitment to equal rights for its LGBT citizens. And if you think about it, those 37 Commonwealth member states comprise more than half of the world's countries that continue to criminalise same-sex relations. Um, in the Commonwealth state of Trinidad and Tobago, the maximum penalty for homosexuality is 25 years. In Malaysia, another Commonwealth member state, it's a maximum of 20 years plus flogging. Uh, as I mentioned, life imprisonment in Uganda, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Guyana, Sierra Leone, and Tanzania. What is profoundly shocking is that never in its entire six decade history has the Commonwealth ever even discussed the human rights of LGBTI people? Not even once. There have been many attempts, many appeals. I've been involved for 30 years in the attempts to get the Commonwealth to at least discuss the human rights of LGBTI people. But in every single Commonwealth heads of government meeting, they have refused. Now we are hoping, we are hoping that in 2018, which is the next Commonwealth Summit, which will take place here in Britain, that we will finally persuade the heads of government meeting to at least discuss the issue. Um, there's no guarantee, but we are hopeful this time lobbying 
will get some movement. And only last week I attended uh, a meeting coordinated by the Kaleidoscope Trust, which brought together activists from Commonwealth countries all across the world, where we've drawn up a, a common framework, a common program to lobby the Commonwealth to get, among other things, to get LGBT issues on the agenda at the next Commonwealth Summit in Britain in 2018. I've mentioned that we have a long way to go, and we certainly do, and what is sad is that although there is progress, and I'll talk about that shortly, although there is progress in many parts of the world, in a number of countries we are witnessing an anti-LGBT backlash. So, in the following countries, Russia, Morocco, Cameroon, Syria, Egypt, Uganda, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Nigeria, Brunei, India, Chad, Zambia, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the Gambia, Burundi, Malaysia, Iraq, and Ethiopia. Did I miss any? In all those countries, they've either passed new anti-LGBT laws, or reversed previous decriminalization, or enforced existing laws with ever greater vigor. Some of these countries embody extreme contradictions. So in Brazil, same-sex marriage is legal, and in most of the major cities, there is legislation that protects LGBT people against discrimination. Yet in certain parts of Brazil, particularly the northeast, there are right-wing death squads who have an agenda of social cleansing. They target sex workers, trans people, and LGBT people for what they call social cleansing, which usually means a bullet in the back of your head. So there's a real big contradiction between what's happening in Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and other big cities, and what's happening in the Northeast with these death squads. The same with Mexico. Mexico City recognizes same-sex marriage. Puerto Vallarta, on the Pacific coast of Mexico, is a gay capital. Yet, Mexico also has right-wing death squads who target socially undesirable people, as they call it, for assassination including LGBTs. Some of you may have seen the report by Outright International about three years ago about Iraq and about the ongoing targeting of LGBT people, both by state agents and by Islamist militias. The targeting of LGBT people for extra judicial killings. We've also, of course, read the reports about the similar scale of extreme violence against LGBT people in Syria being carried out by ISIS in both, well, both Syria and Iraq, where they have territory and control. You know, the return of public executions, mostly the throwing of suspected gay and bisexual men off the tops of buildings, and any who don't die get stoned to death on the ground. We also have the setback in Singapore, where a legal case to overturn Singapore's ban on homosexuality, a legacy of British colonialism which passed the law in the 19th century, that legal case was thrown out by the courts in Singapore. So we've lost that case. Uh, there's also the fear that we may lose a similar case that's being brought in Jamaica. You know, it, it, it might get through, but it's not looking good given the history of jurisprudence in the Caribbean. So it's, it's very easy to feel depressed and disheartened when one hears about all these setbacks and all these ongoing extreme acts of violence in many countries. Um, you know, a lot of people feel, understand to be quite pessimistic. But my view is slightly more optimistic. To me, backlash which is what we're witnessing in about 20 or so countries, 
and I'm emphasizing it's only 20 out of 193, but the backlash we're witnessing there is actually a sign of progress. Every social movement that's won success has gone through a period of backlash. So I'm old enough to remember the black civil rights movement in the United States in the 50s and 60s. And there, the rise of the civil rights movement provoked a backlash. People forget that the number of lynchings and other violent attacks upon black people actually increased in the civil rights era. But that was a, a sadly necessary, although totally regrettable, thing that the movement had to go through in order eventually to emerge victorious. And it's the same with LGBT rights. No one wants backlash. Backlash is bad. It's tragic for the people who are caught in it. But it is a sign that the movement is making progress and it has provoked a reaction by those who want to keep the anti-LGBT status quo. And you know, we will get through the backlash. We, it happened in this country. We got through the backlash of the 1980s. Section 28, the AIDS panic in hysteria, Margaret Thatcher's family values and Victorian values campaigns, the huge spike in gay bashing, murders and assaults, the huge rocketing of arrests of gay and bisexual men. That was all backlash, which many of us have experienced in our own lifetimes in this country. But we got through it, and we emerged after it stronger and better off in terms of public understanding and acceptance, and in terms of legal rights. And so it will be on a global scale in all of these countries. You know, overall, the global trend is towards greater LGBT freedom. So we've seen in the last couple of years the decriminalization of homosexuality in Mozambique, the Pacific Island states of Nauru and Palau, Northern Cyprus, the Seychelles, the West African island state of Seotome and Principe, Belize. You know, the progress is going in the right direction. Um, in India, you know, we've seen a growing move for decriminalization. The, what some of you may see is the right-wing BJP government, which has historically not been sympathetic to LGBT rights. Some people in quite senior positions have recently talked about reviewing the ban on homosexuality. Again, a ban that was a legacy of the British colonial era in the 19th century. Uh, we've seen same-sex marriage being won in Ireland, Slovenia, the United States, and even Colombia, Gibraltar, the British Antarctic Territory, Guernsey, the Isle of Man, and even Pitcairn Island. Pitcairn Island, you, if you know about the history of the mutiny on the bounty, it's where the, many of the mutineers went for a while. Uh, their descendants are settled on Pitcairn Island. The population of Pitcairn Island is 48 people. As far as they know, they don't have any gay, lesbian, bisexual or trans people on the island. <laughs> but two years ago, they decided that just in case they do, and they don't know about it, and just in case they do in the future, they want to be part of the global equality trend. So they legislated same-sex marriage on Pitcairn Island. There's also a push for same-sex marriage in Nepal, Vietnam, Cuba, and Taiwan. Um, a couple of years ago, Vietnam repealed the ban against same-sex marriage. There was actually a legal ban on it, but it's now been repealed, which is seen as a precursor to eventual legalization. Um, we saw a couple of years ago the surprising, the very surprising declaration by the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. Now, that commission is part of uh, the African Union, uh, a very conservative body on matters of sexual human rights and whose member states primarily and overwhelmingly 
criminalize same-sex relations. Yet two years ago, that body issued a declaration condemning discriminatory event and a huge tribute to the African LGBT activists and their straight friends and allies who championed that cause. Um, we're all familiar with Ban Ki-moon, the outgoing, recently departed UN Secretary General, who like his predecessor Kofi Annan, was very, very strong in championing the rights of LGBT people. Speaking out not once or twice, but many times against hate crime, discrimination, criminalization, and so on. And the new Secretary General is also of the same mold, someone who has a history of backing uh, LGBT rights. In Uganda, you'll recall there was an attempt to pass the Anti-Homosexuality Act, which in its original version included the death penalty for repeat homosexual offenders. Um, that was actually passed by the Parliament but later thrown out by the courts, albeit on a technicality that the parliament had not been quorum when the legislation was passed. But it hasn't been reintroduced. There's been pledges of being reintroduced, but that hasn't happened and it looks unlikely to happen as far as I can see. Although things are grim in Russia, there have been a number of victories. There was an attempt to prosecute the St. Petersburg-based LGBT group coming out which was rejected by the court. Quite amazing, given how much the courts and judges are under the thumb of the Putin regime. And there's even been pride parades allowed to go ahead, lawfully, in St. Petersburg for the first time, though not yet in Moscow. Um, in Singapore, I mentioned that the High Court had rejected the bid to uh, scrap the criminalization of homosexuality. But the annual pink dot protest there um, in recent years has had nearly 30,000 people, 30,000 people on a little tiny island state coming out with their pink lights to make a gigantic heart in support of LGBT rights in Singapore. Um, backlash is temporary. It's a blip. In terms of the overall trajectory of history, it's a temporary thing that will pass. But, of course, for those who suffer it, it's pretty terrible. The thing that keeps me going is a recognition that the overall trend is in the right direction. But thanks to many, many really brave, heroic human rights defenders, LGBT activists, and straight allies, that all across the world, we are mostly mostly making progress. And it's really inspiring to me to think that many of these activists are risking their liberty and their lives. I think about Sudan a few years ago. In Sudan, where homosexuality is punishable by death, a group of LGBT people dared to get together to form a secret underground LGBT group. And then even approach the government for dialogue about decriminalization or about some kind of rights for an acceptance of LGBT people. That was an incredibly astonishing, brave thing to do. Unfortunately, because of various things that happened, other unfriendly and unsympathetic government officials and police officials became aware of this and all those activists had to disappear. Some went underground and some left the country because they would have been arrested and could have been at risk of execution. But the fact that they tried in conditions of such extreme personal danger, if they hadn't been executed, they could have easily been jailed for 20 or 30 years. That just shows the enormous courage that some LGBT activists have. You're going to watch a film about David Cato shortly. You know, a very, very astounding, astonishingly brave Ugandan activist who paid with his life. You know, there are so many people in countries around the world who are daily risking their freedom and safety for the sake of 
LGBT freedom. But, you know, whatever the backlash may be, one thing I'm certain of, queer freedom is an unstoppable global trend. That's the way history is going. LGBT equality knows no borders. It transcends all nations and all cultures. And I am absolutely sure that we will eventually make homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia history. Because our freedom has been long delayed, but it cannot and will not be denied. Thank you. Thank you.